Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Dome to Home. My name is Jeremy. I'm so happy that all of you are joining us today. We've got a great episode prepared for you. Above me, we've got my friend Tara. Hey, Tara, how's it going? Hey, Jeremy, good. How are you? Doing so well. Hey, everybody. Good to see you again today. I'm so glad y'all all joined us. We are super excited today for this episode of Dome to Home because we're going to be, again, talking about water in the solar system, but it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about missions that are going to find all of this water in our solar system. So it's going to be really, really cool. Um, as always, if you have any questions throughout the show, uh, you can drop those in the YouTube chat there. Emily is behind the scenes and she's keeping an eye on that. So she'll be able to toss the questions our way. Uh, there's also, we have this new form that you can fill out if you have a questions, if you have trouble with YouTube chat or if you just want to send them in a different way. There should be a link to that in the chat and also in the episode description. So you can use that form to drop your questions too. We'll try to get to some as we go through, but we'll have time at the end too that'll be dedicated for your questions. And as always, don't forget, if you're having trouble seeing any of the visuals, go ahead and make your screen full screen on the YouTube. Make it nice and big. You can see everything really clearly. Did I forget anything, Jeremy? Was that it? I think that's it. We covered it. All, All right. Set. Let's roll. So again, we're talking about water in the solar system and particularly ways that we find it. Now, one of the things that we always have to think about is how do we know that the stuff that we're looking at is even water? That's a great question. There's a couple different ways that we can look at something and tell that it's actually water and not some other sort of substance, liquid or solid or what have you. One of the easiest ways is really just by looking at it. Now that gives us a good idea of if it's, you know, water or ice as compared to something like rock or dirt or in the case of earth, grass and trees and things. So we can actually just look at things and tell that it's most likely ice. Now this is not hard to do. We can do this with telescopes, for instance, even in your backyard or also telescopes like the Hubble telescope. It took some really, well, not great pictures of Mars, <laughs> pictures of Mars though. And you can see that even in these kind of not great pictures, there's these white patches on the North and South Pole. So we can look at those and say, that looks a lot like ice. I don't know, do you think that looks like ice? I'd, I'd say, say so. I'd say it's about ice. Yeah, especially knowing that that's the North and the South <laughs> Pole, Earth has ice at the North and South Pole. So we can kind of make these inferences just by looking at things. Now, sometimes we don't always see the actual water or the actual ice or something like that. We can also look at landforms and say, that looks like a place where there might have been water at one point. And if you joined us for any of our whole summer series about perseverance and going to Mars, you may remember Jezero Crater and how it looks like a place where there used to be a lot of water. In fact, we can show you guys a picture. This is a brand new thing that we're all really excited about. It's per so Perseverance has landed on Mars now and it's driving around down there. And this tracker allows you to look and see where the rover is and has been and where it's going as it moves along its merry way while it's on the surface of Mars. So that's pretty cool. We're gonna drop the link to that in the episode description and in the chat too, in case any of you want to track Perseverance and watch where it goes. It's just a fun little thing we're super stoked about. But if we look at Jezero Crater, like you can see there, you can see that there's something that looks like a river channel, a big delta. These are landforms that we see here on Earth that are related to water. So it makes sense for us to look at these things with our telescopes and our spacecraft and say, huh, that looks like a place there might have been water. So if you did happen to miss out on our summer series for Dome to Home on all of our perseverance, I would definitely suggest checking that out. We did a whole three months talking all about Mars and perseverance and it's really fun. Oh yeah, we did a very deep dive and there's lots of lots of good information over there. So highly Tons. recommend you guys should go check it out. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. 
So you might wonder also, if we're looking, say, let's think about those pictures of Mars. How do we know that those ice caps are actually ice caps and not something else? How do we know that it's water ice and not some other kind of ice? Well, we have this awesome technique called spectroscopy. And some of you may have remembered that from other shows that we've done too. We love talking about spectroscopy. This is an amazing tool for scientists to use. Now spectroscopy, what we do is we rely on different wavelengths of light. And what that means is that you have to think about light as not just the light we see with our eyes, but there's all different kinds of light. There's things like ultraviolet light, infrared light. These are things that maybe you've heard of before, X-rays, also things like gamma rays, but also microwaves and radio waves. These are all different kinds of light. And these different kinds of light can tell us different things, definitely different things than what we would see with our eyes. Now, in particular, we can use a kind of light called infrared light or also UV light. These are the ones we use mostly for planets. We can shoot, say, a beam of infrared light at a planet and see how it bounces back to us. I mean, that's all what we see is. It's light bouncing off of an object and coming into our eyes. And with this infrared light, it can bounce off of that and come back to our telescopes. But every different element and molecule out there reflects light differently. It's almost like a fingerprint. So say if I were to shoot a beam of light at a glass of water, that would look differently than if I shot it at maybe a, my desk or a coffee mug. It's like I could tell if this was grass or astroturf just by seeing how the light bounces back to us. And we can show you an example of the actual data that we look at as scientists. It's kind of weird, but you can see there's the red curve is what it would look like if there was nothing there. If it was just light, it would make that red curved shape. But here you can see how the blue line is kind of squiggly and it's got that big dip in there. That's what we call an absorption feature. And these absorption features happen at different wavelengths based on what the material is made out of. So you can see here, the blue one is water ice, the green one is carbon dioxide. So just by looking at how that light comes back into our telescope and where those absorption lines are, that tells us what kind of molecules and elements and things that we're looking at. So this is incredibly helpful because that means we can study objects from really, really far away and still know what they're made out of. So that's how we can tell like moons around Pluto, we know what they're made out of, even though we've never actually gone there and looked at it or taken samples or things like that. We can do this just with our telescopes instead of having to go all the way to the place. So it's incredibly helpful. Now the third technique that I wanna talk about today that's again, really, really helpful is we can use density and gravity measurements. What does that mean? Well, this is really helpful for the, for the places where we find the water underground, places like Europa, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and Enceladus. This is how, even though we've never been underground on a moon of Jupiter, we can still take measurements and know what the inside is like. So we can kind of think of this, think about how the inside of a planet looks. And I think we have some examples here that we can show you of planets like Earth and Mars and Venus. Yeah, there we go. And you may remember from a science class that Earth's interior has layers. There's a core and a mantle and a crust. Well, all of these different layers have different densities, which means they're different thicknesses almost. A kind of a dense thing is gonna be a lot heavier than a light thing. So when we look at other places like moons around Jupiter, we can take a measure of its total density and say, well, it's much less dense than a rocky planet would be. So it's probably made out of something different. You can also kind of think of it, I have, I brought examples. I have, so we've got like a rock here and a piece of bark. Now they're about the same size and about the same color. But if I were to hand you these two with your eyes closed, would you be able to tell me which was a rock and which was bark? I think you probably could. I'm holding them now and even not looking. One is much, much heavier than the other one. The rock is a whole lot heavier than the bark is. It's because this rock is way more dense than the wood. So that's the same kind of thing that we do with planets. We don't pick them up and hold them, unfortunately, that'd be cool. 
but we can use our spacecraft instruments to tell about how dense they are. So for plant or for moons like Europa, we know that it's much less dense than we would expect if it was made all of rock. So it's got to be made out of something different. And if we know the particular density, say, of water or of ice, we can do some math and kind of figure it out. And that's how we can infer that this underwater ocean exists or this underground ocean exists. So that's another really useful way that we look at these things. Now I said, we're gonna hear, we're here to talk about missions. So we're gonna take you on a quick little tour of some of the missions that are coming up that are going specifically to look for water in our solar system. It's a big deal. So there's always lots of stuff going on. And we're really excited about all of these. The first one we're gonna talk about is our closest one. This is the Artemis program that's going to the moon. Now we know that there's water ice on the moon, down around the South Pole, there's a lot of craters that have ice in them. And we know this because we've had other spacecraft that have flown past and taken measurements and they've detected what looks like water. But we're getting ready to send new spacecraft with the Artemis mission. It's hopefully launching in the next year or two. We'll be sending little instruments to go and orbit around the moon and look at the South Pole to really pinpoint where that ice is. Now, the whole reason we're doing this is because we're also sending astronauts to the moon and we want them to have water to be able to, you know, drink, grow food, things like that, get fuel. Good water is a really useful thing for astronauts to have. So we're trying to find where it is. So here we are at the moon. We can show you a picture of where we see evidence of ice on the South Pole. Ta-da! So the South Pole is the one on the left. That's also the North Pole on the right. So there is ice at the North Pole too, just not quite as much. So this is from a different spacecraft that took some measurements and said, this is probably water ice. But we're just getting ready to send more spacecraft to go and verify this with the Artemis program. There's one in particular called Lunar Flashlight that's going out and is going to scan the South Pole with spectroscopy. We're gonna be using this technique to really pinpoint where that ice is on the South Pole of the Moon. It's pretty cool. Now, another place that we're sending missions is going to be Europa. This is the one I just mentioned earlier. Uh, it's one of the moons around Jupiter. So, Before we head over there, yeah, oh, yeah, here's the picture of lunar flashlight. So you can see what it's going to be doing is kind of flying over these uh, mainly kind of shadowed regions, right, Tara? And yep. then, yeah, kind of essentially shooting laser beams at it, right? And studying, taking spectra of it and finding out kind of what uh, the composition of these regions are. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly what it's doing. Good job, Jamie. Woohoo! All right. You on, paid attention. On to Europa. I'm learning. On to Europa. All right. <laughs> All right I just got so excited. We have so many cool places to go. All right, so we're gonna head over that way. It's gonna take a little bit. I gotta recenter us over here a little bit. And then as we fly over, oh, there we go. As we fly on over, I'll turn on all the orbits of all the different moons of Jupiter. And you will notice that there is quite a bit. Does anybody know how many moons Jupiter has? Drop it in the chat if you know. Oh yeah, a little trivia. How many moons does Jupiter have? So there we go. We have Jupiter in our crosshairs here. We'll start zipping across, see the sun and the inner planets go by. Awesome. And then I'll bring up all these green lines mm -hmm. here. And these are gonna mark the orbits of all of our moons. Jupiter used to have the most moons in the solar system. It was recently surpassed by Saturn. Now Saturn has the most. Look at all that. That it's is a mess. A, a mess. <laughs> 79 is the number. That is how many moons are around Jupiter. All together, there are 79 moons. Saturn is up to 82 now, so it just beat us out a little bit. It's all right. But the ones that we're concerned with today are particularly the four biggest moons, what we call the Galilean moons. We call them this because Galileo was the scientist who discovered them with his very first telescope way back in the 1600s. He found these four big moons. 
It's also the name of a spacecraft that went out to Jupiter in the late 80s and early 90s to go and study these four particular moons. So you can see there, Jeremy's got the orbit of the four moons. Europa is the second one out. So we'll zoom in on that. And here we're coming up on Europa. There it is. And it disappeared. Uh oh. <laughs> Let's bring it back. There it is. There we go. There's Europa. And this is a uh, kind of false color colored image. This is a obviously a black and white um, rendering of it, just to show you a little bit more detail here. Let's kind of zoom around here and show you some of the things that Tara wants to talk about. Yeah. So yeah, we studied Europa and the other Galilean moons with the Galileo spacecraft. And Galileo was revolutionary. That was the first time that we got a really good close up look at these moons. And in particular, it used one of its instruments to do that gravity density measurement thing that I was talking about. That's the reason why we think that Europa has an entire ocean underneath its surface. We can look at the surface and all we see is ice on the outside, but underneath all that ice is a liquid water ocean that covers the entire moon. It's got more water on this moon than on all of the earth, which is crazy because it's smaller than our moon. It's not a big place. We've got a good picture or a drawing at least. Mm -hmm. Again, we've never like landed on the surface so we don't know what it looks like underneath. But this is what we think it might be like. Now, that's a mission that's already happened, again, way back in the 90s, forever ago. So we're getting ready to send some new spacecraft out to Europa. In particular, there's two. There's one from NASA called Europa Clipper that's going to head out there. I think we've got a cool picture of Clipper. There mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. And then there's also a mission from the European Space Agency, or ESA, which is called JUICE. It's, of course, it's an acronym because we love acronyms. It's the Jupiter. Oh, gosh, now I don't even remember. Do you remember, Jeremy, what it all stands for? Uh, do you, uh, no, no, I do no, not. We forgot. We forgot the juice meant. I think the JU is. Oh, no. I, There's I don't, Jupiter I don't, I don't in there. Miss, miss There's speak. ice in there. But it's basically going to study the icy moons of Jupiter. So that's. Yeah, Jupiter, icy moons. Explore. Explore. Yeah. The, there we go. Jupiter, we got it. See, we got Explorer. there eventually. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So Juice is going out there not just to study Europa, but two of the other moons around Jupiter that are also very icy. But we're going to get a lot more information about Europa, including information about maybe how thick that ice is, how much water there actually is, what that water is made out of, things like that. So we're about to learn a lot more about the water around Europa. So that's super exciting. Now there's another place we want to head over to, a moon that's very similar to Europa, but it's a moon around Saturn. This one's called Enceladus. Enceladus is super popular. Maybe you've heard of that one before. Jeremy's going to fly us that way. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some time. Got to orbit around a little bit. And I'll turn on a marker and we'll do the same type of flight that we did to get to Jupiter or to get to Europa. We'll do that to get on over to Enceladus. Spin us around a little bit. Tara, how many moons does Saturn have? Did you already Saturn, say that? I did. It has 82. Shucks. I wasn't paying moons. close enough attention, I guess. <laughs> You're a little busy. It's all right. I was a little busy. It was a little, a little sidetracked. But it's, you know, that number changes all the time. Saturn was at, I think, 52 or 56 for years. And then all of a sudden, like last summer, they were like, oh, we found 20-something new moons around <laughs> Saturn. And the same thing happens with Jupiter all the time. Most of these moons are like little tiny asteroid-sized moons. So they're very small and very hard to see because obviously they're very far away. So we're discovering new ones all the time as we get better and better telescopes and cameras and things. So who knows, maybe Jupiter will reclaim the moon count throne sometime soon. You know me, I'm a Jupiter fan. So <laughs> room for say. Jupiter to have the most. 
All right, here we come up on Saturn. We've got the orbits of some of its moons and we're going to Enceladus, which is really close in. Mm -hmm. Close in, but not the closest in. You can see uh, we're on the, the far side, so it, or the non-sunlit side, so it's hard to see the rings of Saturn right now. But you can see that there's some of uh, these moons that actually orbit inside of the rings. Maybe we'll get a good view as we leave uh, this region of space. Yeah. Coming up on Enceladus here. My favorite thing is those little moons that are inside the rings are called moonlets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's precious. So here we are at Enceladus and you might notice, wow, oh, that does look a lot like Europa. They're very, very similar. Enceladus also has ice on the outside and water on the inside. And we know this again because of a spacecraft, not the Galileo spacecraft. This one was called Cassini. Cassini is very, very famous because it was out orbiting around Saturn for more than 20 years. It was there forever. And we learned so much cool stuff about Saturn and all of its moons, but in particular about Enceladus. There's a little Cassini, hello. <laughs> now, one of the coolest things about Enceladus and Cassini is that because of this, we know that Enceladus has geysers. The whole South Pole is really, really cracked and it's shooting water out of it, hundreds of miles into space. And so there's these huge geysers that are erupting from the South Pole of Enceladus. And these things that we call tiger stripes. You can see here on the, the picture of Enceladus, we're kind of scrolling around. Those blue areas are where it's really cracked. And that's where all that water's spewing out. So this image here in the middle, this little gif there is an actual video of water shooting out of a moon around Saturn. Like, how cool is that? Pretty neat. Hard, I think hard that's to beat amazing. It. Yeah. And so that was really awesome. Not only do we have to infer with gravity measurements and things that there's water underneath the ice on this moon, but we actually see it. And not only that, we saw it well enough and it's going high enough into space that Cassini was able to fly through these plumes of water and take samples and take direct measurements which is way more than we've done with any of these other watery places. And so we found out what was actually, not just that there was water, but there were what was in the water. And we find things like salt, ammonia, methane, even little grains of sand or rock. Now, some of these, you know, things like ammonia and methane may not sound very appealing to us as people, but at least here on earth, these are uh, compounds that are directly associated with life biological processes, living things create these compounds, methane and ammonia. So if we're finding these in the water of a moon a billion miles away, it's probably a good indicator that that might be a good place to look for life. Definitely a very good sign. Yeah. All right, there's just one more place I want to take us today. I know we're like right out of time. If anybody has any burning questions, we can take those as we're flying out to our last destination. Yeah, drop those questions in. We're gonna kind of head out of the solar system and take a, uh, a view from above here, a top-down view. Yes, because the last places we're gonna talk about are the moons around Uranus and Neptune. I see we have a question, which of these moons is most likely to harbor life? Excellent question. Enceladus and Europa are the two biggest candidates right now. And I think that's because we know that they have so much water. With Enceladus, we know because we, you know, again, we detected all these different chemicals that are sort of life-based. We don't know what's in the water on Europa yet. We're hoping to figure that out very soon. But those are the two places that we consider the most ha habitable, maybe not for people, but for life in general, probably some sort of microbial life, little bacterias or critters. Probably not like space whales or anything, but <laughs> little things. That'd be cool though. <laughs> that would be pretty neat. So here we are at Uranus and Neptune. And I just wanted to throw these out here really quickly because these are some of the biggest targets for future missions in planetary science. We are very, very excited. Nothing's been out to study Uranus and Neptune since Voyager 2, which is in 1989. 
So that was a real long time ago. And all it did was fly by really quickly, take a couple pictures, and then it was done. But the more that we learn about Europa and Enceladus, that tells us a lot about these other moons too. We can look at the pictures of these other moons and say, well, they look really similar to Europa and Enceladus. So maybe they have similar properties. We can sort of infer that they could be oceany worlds too. And so Voyager took a couple of really cool pictures of like say Neptune. We've got a really great picture of Neptune, thanks to Voyager. Mm -hmm. It also took the only picture that we have of Triton, one of the moons around Neptune, the biggest moon. And it's only, that's, that's all we have. <laughs> it's about 40% of the moon and that's the only picture we have. So we are really excited to send spacecraft out to places like Triton. In fact, there's a mission that's been proposed. It hasn't been approved just yet. Hopefully that's coming very soon. But there's a mission called Trident that wants to go out to Triton and check it out. It's got, again, spectrometers, gravity measurements, radar, all sorts of things. So we really want to find out if Triton, too, has this big ocean underneath. Okay, I think that's all the missions that we wanted to talk about today. There's so much cool stuff happening, so I had to cram it all in there. But I see we had another question come through. Do we have to investigate each body differently to find life? Ooh, that is an excellent question. Now we have to look at each body individually, yes, but we use the same sort of techniques. Again, we can use spectroscopy to find well different uh, elements and compounds and things that are on the surface. Um, a lot of times we use the, what we call the direct imaging, taking pictures and looking for signs of life, footprints maybe, I don't know, different things that might signal that there's something living there. So I wouldn't say that we have to investigate each place differently. We use the same techniques, but we do have to look at them individually because they all, even places like Europa and Enceladus, they are very similar, but they're also very different in a lot of ways. And because again, they're in different locations, there's a lot of different stuff going on. So we have to look at them kind of on their own, but we can use a lot of the same instruments and the same techniques. In fact, spacecraft reuse a lot of instrument designs. Excellent question. Any, yeah. Any other questions? If, you know me, yeah. I'm always happy to talk about water. Always excited, right? Water and ice and spacecraft. When we're all out here, we'll bring up uh, this little fun image of Voyager uh, just because. Just because NASA makes really cool images of Voyager, and we love Voyager. It's really changed our whole view of our solar system and our outer mm -hmm. solar system. Um, yeah, why not? Throw it up. <laughs> I think it's cute. I think Ooh, it's here's great. another great question that came in. What about other objects that aren't moons? Could they harbor life? Mm. Absolutely. I know I'm kind of biased towards moons and <laughs> moons are one of the places that we find the most opportunities for life because again, moons have tons of water a lot of times, especially these big moons around Jupiter and Saturn and places, Uranus, Neptune, things like that. But absolutely other places could. I mean, obviously planets were looking for life on Mars. There's people who think that there might have at one point been life on Venus. We don't know for sure. But we can also think of places like dwarf planets. There's a dwarf planet called Ceres that we've studied very closely, and it has a lot of uh, ice and possibly water on it. Um, there's asteroids out there like Vesta, which is another really icy kind of place. So pretty much anywhere that has a solid surface is worth checking out. And even places that don't have solid surfaces, you know, Jupiter and Saturn are big and gassy. But there's a very famous uh, sort of proposition put forward by Carl Sagan way back in the 80s, who thought that there might be some sort of like floating cloud life on mm -hmm. Venus. It's too hot for things to live down on the surface, but there could be some sort of life that's evolved to live in the clouds. How crazy would that be? Like a little floating mm -hmm. thing. The floaters the and clouds. the sinkers. You beat me yeah. to it. Um, yeah, I would suggest if anybody has questions about that go check out we just had a special talk last week actually about um crazy creatures in the universe and what life could be like um based on how you know some of the wackier life that we find here on our own earth um i always think back to star wars basically like cloud city you know 
if you had somewhere, you know, on a very gaseous planet, obviously you couldn't live on the surface if there was a surface. Um, but a lot of the atmospheres have, or could have, you know, chemicals or I guess gases that were, are conducive to life. So you could imagine some sort of society living in the clouds. In the clouds. That's the other thing we have to remember, too, is that life other places is not necessarily anything like life here on Earth. I mean, even here on Earth, we find life in crazy places. There's little things that live at the very bottom of the ocean where there's no sunlight. There's bacteria that live inside of volcanoes. They find things that live on the outside of the space station. So just because a place is maybe really hot or really dry or doesn't have a ground, it's just gas, who knows? There could be all sorts of stuff out there. It's kind of scary to think about how much we actually don't know about life and what makes something alive. Mm -hmm, very much so. Any other burning questions right here at the end? Do we have anything else coming through? Get them in now. If not, you can also always come back and comment on these videos and we uh, will check them and then reach back out to you afterwards. Yeah, you can drop them in that form too. That link is good for all times. So if you drop something in that, if we didn't get to it today, we'll either respond to you or maybe cover it in the next video that we're doing. So if there's not any other questions coming through, that will wrap us up for today. Speaking of the next video we're doing, definitely come back next week because we are going to have a very special guest speaker. It's one of my favorite people in the entire world, Dr. Dave Brain. He is a specialist in Mars's atmosphere and atmospheres in general. And he's gonna tell us a lot about how planets like Earth and Mars and Venus have changed over time and what that means for the water that is there or used to be there or isn't there anymore. What happened to all that water? Where did it go? Why did it go? That's his thing. And he's gonna tell us all about it. It's gonna be super cool. So definitely check back next week. Otherwise, uh, subscribe, like, share with your friends, do whatever you need to do to make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. Drop us a comment if you want to say something nice to us. We always like seeing that. And of course, you can go to our website, uh, colorado.edu slash Fisk. That's got a schedule of all of our upcoming episodes, plus all sorts of other cool stuff, different shows, and options to donate if you would like to help keep Fisk doing our awesome online programming. We'd super appreciate it. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.